That's okay, I brought her back up. <laughs> you know, sometimes I was a Boy Scout when I was younger. Any, any Boy Scouts in the room? You know, Boy Scout model, be prepared. I'm not always like that, but every once in a while, I'm still prepared. Hey, welcome to Aldersgate. We're so glad that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we want to touch on a couple things. One, real quick, when you walked in, you got a Connect card. Connect card is a great way for you to be able to connect with what's going on here at Aldersgate. It has a little tear-off right here. And in that tear-off, you have an opportunity to update your information. Sometimes we get uh, emails saying, hey, uh, we haven't got the newsletter or we're not getting the mail outs that come out. This is a great way for us to be able to know, hey, we don't have your right address. We don't have your right email, whatever that might be. Great way to do that. On the back side of this, there's a prayer request card. And I don't know, some of you may know that uh, prayer requests go out every, almost every day here at Aldersgate of things that the body of Christ is lifting up in prayer. And so if you're ever in a point where you come here on Sunday morning, there's just something weighing down on you. We would love for you to connect with us through that connect card, through that prayer circle right there. Um, hold on to that because on the back side of this, there's a little bullseye looking thing um, that is not to play darts with later. It's got a point. So hold on to that. You'll see that later. Uh, but at this time during our service, we're going to take up our offering. So if you're helping out with that, if you'll go ahead and come forward, they're going to come forward and begin to pass those baskets and <coughs> as they pass the baskets, we want to highlight something this morning as we typically do during this time of our service. Uh, this weekend, some of you know, was Encounter Weekend for our students. And um, Encounter Weekend is just an awesome time for us to be able to uh, love on our students and have our students be able to focus their attention on who Jesus is. And so as these guys pass the baskets this morning, taking up our offering, we've got some students who are going to come up and share a little bit about Encounter Weekend. So as they come up... Um, I want to just let you know real quick that our theme for Encounter Weekend, uh, some of you know uh, this event used to be, be called Evolve. Uh, it's been rebranded this year uh, into Encounter. And so the simple question that we ask ourselves, you see it on the back of the shirts, is what does it look like to have an encounter with Jesus? And not just have an encounter with Jesus, but walk away different, to walk away changed, to see life transformation happen because of the encounter you had with the living God. And so we've got some students this morning that want to share with you a little bit uh, about what the encounter that they had with Jesus looked like this week. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Boo, and I'm a sophomore, and uh, what I got most out of Encounter Weekend was last night we had these things called, or yesterday, we had these things called breakout sessions, and the first one was high school, and the middle school was like interspersed or whatever, and the second one, uh, you got to pick, the high schoolers got to pick which one they wanted to go to. Well, I went to Amy Smallwood's uh, session, and hers was called Where Does Jesus Fit, and hers was about throughout your day, just finding somewhere to fit Jesus, because we all can, they're just, you know, lists of excuses, and I felt called to go to that one, because I'm that person that makes the excuse all the time, and I went, and it was incredible, it was, it changed the, it changed my perspective on everything, and she was talking about how we do have control of our time, how we have control of our money, and how our friends are a bigger influence than our parents are, and it just really touched me, because Everything she said literally fit into my life, into my situation perfectly. And I just felt God say, this is why you're here. I want you to pay attention to this. I want more of you with me. And it was, it was incredible. It was just such an eye-opener. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Mackenzie Bolton. I'm the better Mackenzie, by the way. Um, um, I'm a seventh grader at New Home ISD. And um, I've had a pretty rough life, I guess you could say. Um, whenever I was in the third or fourth grade, my birth mom basically said that she didn't want me or my brother. After that, it was like my self-confidence just plummeted to the ground. It was as if there was this possessive voice in the back of my head that said, you aren't good enough. No one loves you. You aren't even pretty. Just a fat girl that no one will ever like. These have just been getting worse as I go through middle school. In the fifth grade, I had this girl whom I thought was my, who I thought was one of my very best friends. About second semester, she came up to me while I was in, while I was getting my books out of my locker. She told me that I wasn't cool enough to hang out with her. I remember going home and I would cry myself to sleep every single night. That was just the beginning of bad things at school. Everyone at my school calls me Mac because there are about five other McKinsey's. I'm not sure y'all noticed, but I'm not exactly a size two in the waist. If you haven't realized where I'm going with this already, some kids started to call me Big Mac, like the McDonald's hamburger. 
That was it for me. When they started to call me that, I couldn't help but remember my stepdad basically telling me I was fat, and then I stopped eating. I had an eating disorder, so my friends calling me Big Mac just made me want to start again. So in the summer between 6th and 7th grade, I made the decision that I was going to change, that I was going to be popular, I was going to be liked. I started to wear more makeup than what I'm normally used to wearing so I could cover up my flaws. I bought a new wardrobe so I could fit in more. I started to talk like my cousin Blake because he's super cool, so I figured if I said things like lit or poppin', then I would fit in. But y'all, I felt so empty. I'm going to backtrack a few years to the third grade. My big brother, Roberto Hunter, uh, got baptized. I wanted to be cool like him, so I decided that I got baptized. But it wasn't really baptism. I just got dipped in some water and got a new Bible. But this past summer, I realized that I wanted to get baptized, for real this time. That had been on my heart this whole time. On Friday night, Nathan Teeters, our pastor dude for the weekend, talked about how when he was a teenager, he had been addicted to drugs. He said that he went to church camp with them, and in the middle of the sermon, he talked about how God said that he needed to go up to the altar and lay the drugs down. When he said that, God told me that some that sometime this weekend, I was going to lay something down on the altar. Of course, like any rational 13-year-old girl, I was wrestling with God over it. I told him, yeah, right, I'm going to get up there in front of all these kids and embarrass myself. But then he made an altar call. I went up and asked Jesus into my heart. I wanted to chase after God for the rest of my life. Then yesterday night, God told me when I woke up, today's the day that you leave behind a sickness. Once again, I said, whatever. Last night on the first song, God told me that I didn't need to worry anymore. I didn't need to fear the way people think about me because God made me in his own image. I didn't need to be anyone else. He loved me for me. It was then that I started bawling, and I mean full out sobbing. One of my super close friends, Mackenzie Boo, was standing next to me and just hugged me and prayed for me. I'm pretty sure she was crying too. She held me for the rest of worship. When Nathan started to go back up to pray, we went to the restroom so I could clean off all my makeup. God told me that I needed to write down all the trouble that I've had with insecurities and that I needed to tear it out of my journal. And when he told me to, I was supposed to take it to the altar and leave it there. For once this whole weekend, I said, okay, God. When we went back out to listen, I will admit that I didn't hear a word of the sermon. I was busy writing away in my journal about my insecurities. At the end of a sermon, I folded up all three pages and stood with everyone else. It took me a few minutes to get to work up the guts to go up there in front of everybody and just lay down this piece of paper. I walked up and set it down on the third step. As I turned, I felt like this huge weight had been lifted off of my shoulders. I realized that I was free. I couldn't help it, but my eyes filled with the most happy tears. I went up when he was still preaching, y'all. When I got back to my seat, Nathan said that if anyone in the room has anxiety, just raise your hand. I raised mine highest of all. Of all these people around, all these people around me just reached out and put their hand on me. They started praying for me. I didn't even know most of them. I started full out sobbing again, and I mean like the most embarrassing, loudest sobs you could ever imagine. Worship had started again, and I just fell on my face. I was in awe of how wonderful our almighty God is. When we were told to walk out, I saw most of my youth group surrounding my new best friend, Peyton. They were all praying for him. By then, my tears had dried up, and I promised myself I wouldn't cry again. Well, God had other plans. You see, my boy Peyton, he gets made fun of at school. When I learned this, it broke my heart because he's the most beautiful person inside and out. He has such a compassionate heart, and I learned this over a period of two days. He was crying out, saying he didn't want to go back to hell, or in other words, school. All I did was reach out and hold his hand, and I, and I started sobbing all over again. I could feel how broken he was, and it made my heart break even further. It was such an emotional night, but I'm very excited I got, that I got to spend the weekend growing in God with some of my biggest mentors in life. That was my encounter. Hello, is it on? Is it on? Oh, hi. Um, my name is Madison Boo, and my encounter was really awesome. I was just singing a song like what I would do, and um, I looked up um, at God, and I was like, God, I want to change. And he was like, you need to change. And so just realizing the words that I was saying changed my life. When you think about what you're saying and not just saying it, it makes, like, you feel really good because you know what you're actually saying now. And so my encounter was knowing what I was saying and that God was with me the whole entire time.
So my name's Bailey, and uh, Encounter was awesome, guys. Um, being a senior, this is my sixth year to go to this event, and it never fails to um, just inspire and invoke a lot of emotion in you. Um, I didn't have this big, like, revelation or anything, but um, I'm going to touch on Mackenzie's point of, like, the re, uh, when he had the altar call. Um, 50 plus people gave their life to Christ this weekend, the first night, uh, before anything, one, one sermon, we still had two more to go, it was great, it was awesome. Um, God always shows up, God never fails to come here. Um, and so all, for all y'all that did stuff, like, it was well worth it, the donations were well worth it, because it changes lives. Um, God's great, um, these three are awesome examples about it. So that was my encounter, thank y'all. Hi, I'm Jordan Burke. I'm a senior. Um, I'm nervous, and this is going to be messy, but God's going to use it, so it's okay. Um, this weekend, God, there was tons of encounters with God, um, a lot of people. We were told at the beginning of the first sermon, like, be expectant. Like, you don't go in the rain expecting to not get wet, so be in the presence of God expecting to have this encounter. And so... Um, it wasn't ever a question for anyone, like, if an encounter was going to happen. It was just a matter of when. When, God? When am I going to have my encounter? Um, so for me, mine was on Saturday afternoon after um, Michael's session. He taught us um, five ways that we can hear God. And my session that I went to was with Jason Archuleta, and he was giving us um, basically the tools to hear God, to see God. Um, so he had us in a dark room, and there was very little lighting, and there was soft music playing, um, and he just told us, get comfortable, lie down, close your eyes, relax, breathe. Um, so we were breathing, we were laying there with our eyes closed, um, and he said, I want you to imagine God in front of you, whatever he looks like. Does he look like a family member? What does he look like to you? Um, where is he? What is he doing? And so... Um, Um, so I'm going to give backstory before I start um, mine. Um, when I was 10, my parents were divorced um, because my father made very, very, very poor decisions and um, had various affairs for very many years. Um, and so for me, as a 10-year-old girl, seeing my father leave um, ripped me apart. I was worthless. He gave up, Daddy, Daddy, you're home. He gave up kissing me to bed. He gave up taking me to school. He gave up seeing me go to prom and um, all these things in my life. And so I was completely worthless. Um, but whenever I was a freshman in high school, I had this amazing opportunity to go to Africa and to build dorms for kids that needed shelter when they went to school. Um, and in Africa, these people just want to be a part of you. They see you and they want to grab onto you. They want to hold you. And so I was walking down a dirt road in Africa with friends and we were going to the, our site and um, all these African children just started running up. And before, like you only have two hands and there's like 12 kids like grabbing your fingers and your clothes. Um, and in that moment, I just heard God talking to me. Like you are so, look at these people. Look, they just want to be a part of you. And this is the way I want to be a part of you. This should be the way you want to be a part of me. And so um, that brought so much worth back into my life in that moment. And so when Jason said, picture God, he was on that dirt road again. And that took me back to my freshman year of high school. And um, he said, he gave us a few minutes and we would just breathe and I'm already like in tears, like laying down on the floor crying. And um, he said, okay, God's going to walk up to you and he's going to touch you, whether he kisses you or holds your face or just lets you sob in him. What is he doing? And he said, he's going to talk to you now. You listen, you breathe. What is he going to say to you? And just hearing God say, I've always, I've always held you. I've always held you like, ripped me apart. Like, I don't know. Like, that was everything that I ever needed in that moment, that he had always held me. And that he said, you're strong, and you've always been strong, but I'm stronger yet. 
you keep holding on to me. You keep letting me hold you. And that was just, that was my encounter. Seeing he, I can't even explain like how bad I just want to go home right now and turn off my lights and play some nice soft music so I can see God's face again. <laughs> but that was my encounter. And this is just a small taste of what God did this weekend. Um, and you get to see uh, just a little uh, glimpse of, of heaven in that because when we have true encounters with Jesus, it's, it's like we're fully in the presence of him. And that someday we're going to get to do that for eternity. And it's an amazing thing to be able to see just a little taste of that. So let's give one more round of applause for all of our students who came up and... Okay. So obviously something like this, uh, Encounter Weekend, doesn't happen without you guys. Um, and obviously um, that's something that we are very thankful for. Um, this, this, everything that we went in, I mean, all of the, the production and the planning, uh, the resources, all that kind of stuff, uh, doesn't happen without you. Uh, a lot of uh, time, a lot of money, a lot of energy, a lot of volunteer hours, a lot of snacks. I mean, we filled these host homes full of snacks, and, and I just want to express a little bit of gratitude to you guys uh, for helping us do this, because obviously you see the difference it makes in the lives of students when the body of Christ, the community that meets in this place, uh, comes together for a great cause. So uh, I, I just I was there for just a little bit this weekend of encounter, uh, and so there's just some observations I made. I know community is a big part of it, and uh, it's just, that's ironic because we're talking about community today. Crazy. So we're in a series at Aldersgate called Walk This Way, and what we're doing is we're talking about encounters with Jesus every Sunday and how we take Jesus' habits and put those habits into our own lives. And so this morning, we want to talk about the habit of community. So one of the things I noticed at Encounter Weekend is so there's like total, how many students? 300 and... There were about 315 students altogether. So 315 students because it's not just Aldersgate. We partner with churches uh, from all across the South Plains. And so all these students come together. Aldersgate has how many students? We took 82 students. 82 students. So that's really, really incredible. And then what they do is they break these students up and they stay in host homes on Friday night and Saturday night. And so we have the high school boys in a host home. We have the high school girls in a host home. We have the middle school boys in a host home. By the way, we had 22 22 middle school boys in one and home. 28 middle school girls in one home. Yeah. So, and Janie Bailey's still my friend, I think. Yeah. So, um, and, and then the thing beyond that I noticed was that when I was there and I would see the students on break and stuff, I would see them like in groups of two or three or maybe even four that even smaller than that. And I also noticed that some of the students talked about it, that you meet in sessions where all the students are together, 300 and whatever are together. Then you have these breakout sessions where you have 40, 60 mm -hmm. students. And then beyond that, you have groups of 12 or even three with like one person just, yeah. you know, doing that. And so, uh, so this is really amazing to me to see. What, what would you say as a pastor to students, how would you define community? A lot of what I would say community is, is building relationships with people that you regularly live life with. Um, and obviously that happens in different levels. Uh, you see that even in, in encounter with the different groups that you see meeting. Uh, obviously they're building relationships in their host homes, they're building relationships in their seminar groups, in their small groups, and they're building relationships with the big group all together, all 320 in, uh, experiencing the same things together. So I would say the people that you're living life with, doing life with in relationship with Jesus and relationship with each other. Yeah, so the focus of Encounter Weekend was not community, but Encounter couldn't happen without community. Exactly. So we're, we're talking about community today. I, the bullseye that Michael was referring to, I want you to pull it out right now. And I'm actually going to put this up here. And I, I want you to get a pen. So if you have one in your purse or your pocket or you can reach down there in the seats in front of you. And on this, it's really not a bullseye. It's some concentric circles. And, and what we saw at Encounter Weekend this weekend is exactly Jesus' model of community. And so in Jesus' model, what you see is that he had these crowds that were always around him. So the 308, I mean, this is a crowd. I was there. Trust me, it's a crowd, all right? And then you had these smaller groups, so the breakout sessions, which were like 40, 50, 60, 70. Jesus had a, a smaller group than the crowd, but then he even had a smaller group than that of the twelve. 
you know, Simon and James and John and, you know, those, that group. And so, and then even beyond that, he had an inner circle, James, Peter, and John, the three. And I saw this model that encounter weekend. And, and what I want to do this morning is I'm going to use that as a springboard to show us that this is what naturally happened with the students this weekend. And this is the habit of community. I'll show it to you out of scripture. So thanks, Michael, so much for everything. But, uh, and hey, thanks, Michael. And as uh, I know, let's see, Austin and Sarah are with their group homes right now, right? Our student interns. But uh, you certainly want to come up to these students today and thank them for sharing with us this morning. We contemplated not even having a message today. And also, um, because that is the message, right? And then also for all of those who are involved this weekend, I would encourage you to do that. But here's what I want to do. I want to show you this out of Scripture, out of the Bible. So take your Bible and open up to the book of Mark. If you don't have a Bible on you, I'm going to put the Scripture up here, but you can also pull it up on your phone or you can grab a Bible there in the seats in front of you. And I want us to look at this uh, the discipline of community that Jesus had and ask ourselves this morning, how can we put this discipline, how can we put this habit into our own lives? I'm going to be in Mark chapter 3. I'm going to go a couple of different places in Mark this morning, but we're going to start in Mark chapter 3. And I want you to see this. I'm going to start with us in verse 7. I want you to see this thing, this crowd, then this 72, then this 12, and, and then this 3. Okay? Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 7. It says this, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed. From Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around the Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Now skip down to verse 13 for me. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. And then he lists the twelve that he has appointed. Do you see the concentric circles here? Do you see part of Jesus's? Community. I want us to look at it. Let's look at it in a different way. I've got a different scripture I'm going to put up here for you so that it highlights some things so you can actually see this, all right? Same scripture, but now look what I've done. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed. When the crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd lest they crush him. Do you see that outer circle of the crowds? Jesus always had crowds that were trying to press into him. Jesus always had groups of people. In fact, the word crowd means multitude. He always had these tons of people, lots of people that were trying to press into him and, and to touch him or to just be able to see him or to hear from him. I'm just going to be real honest with you this morning. Maybe some of you identify with this in here this morning. I don't like crowds crowds. I'm an introvert. Don't put me in a crowd, right? I don't like being around. I grew up small school. Like the largest class I had the whole time in high school for some of you students was like 24 kids. I came to Texas Tech University. My very first class was in Holden Hall. Do you know what I'm talking about? 300 kids, right? Like, it's too big for me. My kids, they love sporting events, so we're always at sporting events. You know, we go to these sporting events, and there's always crowds at these sporting events, and they always want to touch me. You know, I'm like, don't touch me. Get away from me. You go sit, and, you know, you pay big bucks to go to these sporting events, and you sit in a seat that's half the size of your rear end. You know what I'm talking about? Maybe it's my rear end. I don't know, but these seats are so small. And they have an armrest on each side. And the person I'm sitting to that's not my family, they always want my armrest. I'm like, get off. That's my armrest. This is my space. Get out of my space. I don't like this. This is the vision. This is that outer circle, okay? These are the crowds that were pressing in around Jesus. Now, listen to me. You can worship in a crowd, but you cannot connect to community in a crowd. 
You can worship together with lots of people, but you cannot connect in true community with all of those people. Crowds aren't bad. Jesus had crowds. But let me tell you about the people in those crowds. You see, they were just there, not because they wanted a deep connection with Jesus or anybody else in the crowd. They were there because they wanted something from Jesus, and if they got it, they disappeared. That's not true community. And so often, it's so easy for us to just blend in to the crowd, whether it's 380 students at an encounter weekend or 200 people sitting in here this morning. It's easy to blend in to the crowd, but we have to ask ourselves, are we there just to get something that we want and leave, or are we there for community because God wants us here for community? I'll show you that here in just a moment. And you can worship together in a crowd, but you cannot connect to community in a crowd. That's why Jesus' model of community went beyond the crowds. It went to this smaller group, which was actually a larger group. We don't really know how many were in the group. One place in Luke chapter 10 tells us that there were 72 of them. So we'll use that number, but we really don't know. But it's the word disciples. Now, this is going to blow some of you away this morning because many of you in here think the disciples are what? The 12. That's not how Mark uses it. Mark tells us that the disciples were not the crowd, but they were this larger group. In fact, the word disciple means learner or pupil. And these were people that Jesus, as a master rabbi, as a master teacher, would have. Not just the 12, but more, 50, 60, 70. And he would be teaching them, and they would be learning from him. And this was the group that was around him. And he said, listen, let's get in the boat. Let me get out in the boat and teach from the boat, because this crowd is going to crush me. Those were the disciples. Those were the learners, the pupils of Jesus here at church at Aldersgate, we have it set up like, you know, Encounter Weekend, we did breakout sessions. We do breakout sessions every week here. On Sunday mornings, we have breakout sessions. We've got some groups going right now that are breakout sessions. Those are the learners. Those are the people. Listen, that's where you go to learn. You get into Bible study, right? Someone's going to teach you about parenting. Someone's going to teach you about marriage. Someone's going to teach you about the book of Colossians. Someone, you know, you can sit, but listen, in those groups, you can still not connect to community. You can still blend in. Now, you're there to learn, and you can do some great learning, and you can be a great pupil. But you're still not connected to true community. You're just the disciples, which is why Jesus' discipline of community went beyond that. Look what happened. He went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him, and he appointed 12 whom he also called apostles. Apostles are different than the disciples. Now, I've been guilty in my life of using those terms interchangeably. Mark makes it very clear to us that that was not Jesus' community. Jesus had disciples whom he taught. He had apostles who were his friends. You know what the word apostle means? It means to be sent out on mission. It's very different from disciple. Disciple. Disciple means to learn. You can learn and never put into practice what you learn, right? Apostle means to be sent out, to learn and to be sent out to do what you've learned. But watch, I want you to notice something that Mark tells us here in Mark chapter 3. Notice before they were sent out, what did he do? He called to him those whom he desired and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also called apostles, so that they might be with him. And he might send them out to preach. Certainly the apostles were called to go and preach and to do all the things that Jesus was equipping them to do. But the first reason Jesus called the 12 to him was so that they would be with him. It speaks of our human desire to connect with other people, to be in relationships with other people. Remember, Jesus was fully human, right? As a fully human person on the face of this earth, Jesus wanted to connect with other people. He couldn't do it in the crowds. He couldn't even do it in those that he was teaching in the larger group. He needed a smaller group 
that he could call friends. He, he did this as someone who was fully human, but remember God was also, Jesus was also fully God, right? Scripture tells us that we're made in his image. Do you know that the very image of God is to live in community? We call it the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That God himself lives in community. And if we're made in his image, then we had that desire to live in community. And I don't mean with our multiple personalities. I mean with other people. The Trinity. When I was growing up, I heard all the analogies. Well, it's like an egg. You have the shell, you have the yolk, and you have the white of the egg. Three different, three different things, but still one egg, Right? Or I heard, well, the analogy is uh, like water. It can exist in a, leak, a, a, a solid, a liquid, or a gas, right? It's still one substance, but it can exist in three different states. Or even like myself, okay, so I can be uh, uh, different roles. I, I can be a, a husband, a father, and a pastor, by the way, in that order. But I'm still one person. Okay? All of those analogies fall short of the Trinity. But the point is, is that we were created to live in community. Jesus, being fully God and fully human, needed that community of those 12. And I want you to notice something. Watch. How did the crowds get to Jesus? They just showed up, didn't they? Because they wanted something. How did the disciples get to Jesus? It says they came to him. They came and asked if they could be his pupil, if they could learn from him, if he would teach them. But notice what he did with the apostles. He called to him those he wanted to be his apostles. He chose the apostles. So when I went into ministry, we're, we're all in ministry, right? You get that? But when I went into this place where I started getting paid to do what I do, we had lots of people that spoke wisdom into our lives. You know what it's like, right? People are always wanting to give you their two cents their opinion, here's what you need to do, here's what you need to watch out for. Here's, when, I, when I went into ministry, we had people that were in ministry that sat down with Amy and I and said, hey, here's some things that you need to watch out for. Here's some things you need to be careful of. Here's some things you need to protect. Here are some things. One of the things we heard over and over and over from people when we made this transition was this. You need to be careful with your community. The community that you currently have. You're going to have to work hard to protect that community. You're going to have to work hard to keep those friends. You're going to have to work hard in this transition with those that you would call apostles, those that you would call your friends. And, and really, I'm going to be honest with you. When Amy and I started getting that advice, we just passed it off. We didn't think a whole lot about it. But now, 10 years later, if I was to give someone going into ministry advice, you know that's the first piece of advice I would give them. You know, it's because, I mean, it, nobody's to blame, but listen, nobody wants to invite the pastor to a party. <laughs> Every party has a pooper, right? <laughs> I, I walk into conversations sometimes with groups of 12 or even larger than 12, and the conversation drastically changes turns. You can see it, or it stops altogether. Because I'm the pastor. I didn't change. Listen, I, I'm not telling you this so that you'll, you know, throw a pity party for us. Listen, Amy and I have grown past this. Here's what I want to tell you. Here's the point I'm trying to make. Amy and I had to learn that we had to choose community and we had to work at it. It's not just going to show up in your lap. I get it all the time from church people. Well, no one said hello to me. Did you say hello to anyone? Well, no. Well, well, no one invited me. Well, invite yourself. Go. You didn't, invite, you didn't mind inviting yourself into my office to tell me this. <laughs> I'm all about hospitality. The Bible tells us to be hospitable. We're all about trying to be friendly out here. It breaks my heart when people tell me they came as a first-time guest and no one said hello to them. I get it. But listen, community is not just going to fall in your lap. Jesus chose the 12. You want community, you got to do something to work for it. 
You got to get into community. You got to take the next step. You got to do something to move beyond the crowd or the group of 72 to get into a group of 12. We give you all kinds of opportunities here at Aldersgate. Every Sunday, Michael or someone will come up here at the end of the service and they'll tell you, hey, we want you to take your next step. We want you to go right out through these doors and to your right, you'll find the next steps area. And in the next steps area, you can do one of three things. You can become an owner. We'll talk you through what that means. You can join a group, which means apostles. Or you can find a place to serve, which you can also find community there. Did you know that? Listen, you can't miss the room. We painted it really, really bright. You can't walk past it. Every week, we give you the opportunity to do that. Every week, we put out in front of you on social media and on our website uh, uh, a Taking the Next Step video where we take the message and we go just a little bit deeper in less than five minutes where you can get people who can gather around you in your normal everyday activities and you can just watch a video in three to four minutes and then you can have discussion around that video and you can learn together. You can grow together. One of our value statements here at Aldersgate is growing people grow together. One of the first steps to growing together is getting into a group where you can grow. It's not just going to show up at your house. You've got to take that next step. Jesus didn't just wait for the 12 to show up. He chose them. This week, we kick off a whole bunch of new uh, small group studies. They're all the same. It's called Living Crazy Love, but we've got a whole bunch of different times that they're meeting, places that they're meeting. You can go to our website, aldersgatelive.org, and you can look at all those dates, those times, the leaders, the houses. You can see where they're meeting, and you can sign up. If you don't want to get online, you can walk out these doors this morning, go to the table to your immediate left, and you can sign up there. Here's what I want you to understand. You have to choose community. You have to. Jesus did. And if Jesus did, does that mean we're exempt? (laughs) Here's the other thing. We get the list of the disciples. I think I've got the scripture for you, but this is in Mark chapter 3. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the nickname Sons of Thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, and Judas Iscariot. Now, let me tell you something. Some of you are afraid of community because you've been in a group before that was just weird. (laughs) Have you looked at this list of people? (laughs) If this small group can work... Any small group can work. Simon, he was given the name Peter. He was emotionally unstable. And Jesus said, your name's going to be Peter the Rock, and on you I'm going to build my church. And you know what? He did. Let me tell you about some of the other ones. The brothers, James and John, they appeared to be quiet, but nope. Inwardly, they were fierce competitors to the point where their nickname was Sons of Thunder. It was like they were wrestlers, right? Tag team wrestlers. Andrew was a simple-minded person. He was very quiet and introverted, but he was a man of great possibility. Philip was mathematically oriented, but he learned that Jesus' math was very different from his. Bartholomew was a man of honesty. He spent a lot of time under trees meditating on the word of God. Matthew was a tax collector. Thomas was a man of doubt, and he was reluctant to believe in anything unless there was evidence for it. Thaddeus was also known as the good Judas. How would you like for that to be your nickname? (laughs) Simon the Zealot was a member of the resistance movement that wanted to overthrow the Roman government. And Judas was never able to give up his greed for money and eventually betray Jesus over it. If that small group can work, any small group could work. And listen to me, Jesus chose them. Every single one of them. I'm going to take you a little bit deeper, though, because it wasn't just the 12. Within the 12, Jesus had an inner circle, his best friends, his BFFs, his his people that were closest to him, Peter, James, and John. On three different occasions in the Bible, I'll show them to you really quick. In Mark chapter 5, verse 37, Jesus is going to heal Jairus' daughter. Jairus was a leader in the synagogue, and his daughter was sick. She eventually died. 
As he went in to heal her, Scripture tells us this in Mark chapter 5, verse 37. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John. In Mark chapter 9, verse 2, we get the story of the transfiguration. Jesus went up on a mountain. He became bright, so bright they couldn't even stand to hardly look at him because his appearance changed. Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament showed up with him and were told in Mark chapter 9 verse 2 that Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John. They were the only ones who got to see this event. Mark chapter 14, Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's going to be arrested and crucified. He took three inside the garden deeper to pray with him. Guess who they were? James, Peter, and John. Jesus had a multitude of followers. He had a smaller crowd of those disciples that he taught that were his pupils. He had 12 friends that he chose to do life together with. And he had three that saw and heard things nobody else saw and heard. That he shared things with nobody else got to see or hear. For you, it may be three. For you, it may be two. For me, it's one. I want you to look back at those concentric circles. And here's what I want you to ask yourself this morning. Where do you need to take the next step? Go ahead, get it in front of you. Look at your crowds. Look at the larger groups you do life with. Look at the 12. Look at the three me ask you this morning where do you need to take the next step to experience community what do you need to do today to take the habit of community that Jesus gave to us and put it into practice God as we stare at these concentric circles this morning would you speak to us about where we need to take the next step God, we thank you for the crowds in our lives. But God, this morning we understand that we can get lost in a crowd. That we can worship with a crowd, but we can't connect to real community with the crowd. And so God, help us take the next step beyond that. God, maybe we need to take the next step of putting ourselves in place of being an apprentice, of being a student, of being taught. But even there, realizing, God, that you have more for us in the way of community. Maybe this morning we need to take that next step of choosing community. Of getting out of our comfort zone and getting into something where we can grow together. God, if it was something that you desired and you needed, then how can we stand here today and say it's something we shouldn't desire, something we don't need? And for God, for those of us who sit here and we know we have the three or the two or the one in our lives, can we just spend some time this morning giving you thanks for bringing them to us? For allowing us to have people in our lives that we can share things with that nobody else gets to hear or see. And God, would you just speak to us clearly this morning about how we need to take the next step to put this practice of community in our lives. God, we've heard stories from the students of how they had encounters with you this weekend, all in the subcontext of community. God, may you do the same thing in this place. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come forward. The altar's going to be open. More than anything, I want you to keep staring at those concentric circles and asking yourself this morning, where do I need to take the next step. Maybe you want to talk to somebody about it. Come forward. One of our prayer team members will be here. If anything's going on in your life, you can come forward and visit with one of them, pray with one of them. You can come to the altar. Maybe you just want to come and bring it. Maybe you want to write on your concentric circles some of the people in your life. Maybe you want to write where it is you need to take the next step. Jesus wants this habit in our lives.